It's the breakfast in Plus TV Africa. We take you through the pages of our national dailies. Ezekiel Yai took his on standby to join the conversation and make sense of all of the top stories. I set off with the leadership newspaper and usually we pay attention to uh, the top stories. The banner caption says, ESWAP attacks on the rise. Governor Zulem cries out. ESWAP attacks on the rise. Governor Zulem cries out. Says two local governments still under terrorist control. Gunmen kill 18 people in Plateau Village. 8,372 killed. 5,018 abducted in 2021, according to reports. And bandits kidnap more traders in Kaduna. President Mohamed Buhari reiterates commitment to end banditry. Uh, There's a writer's underneath the board caption. Away from that, seven months after federal government leaves banned on Twitter operations. Uh, quite interesting right there. Um, Tunubu, Tunubu and Umayi, other aspirants play down pressure to declare publicly. Uh, you also have Atiku Saraki or Koracha to declare soon. Uh, it's also another writer you find. And APC convention, Mohammed closes ranks with other chairmanship aspirants. And Mayfully not resigning or contesting for presidency, that's according to the CBN. 18,000 apply for 10,000 police jobs. And uh, father kills three daughters, dump bodies in freezer. Uh, President Mohammed Buhari and others mourn ex governor. Uh, a color, that's what you find there. That's the much we can take on the leadership newspaper. All right, quickly on the punch newspapers. Terrorists on the rampage in Plateau. Uh, Niger kill 52 abduct hunters and others. Niger terrorists tied victims' hands to their backs before shooting them, says residents. And along demands arrest as invaders gone down 18 in fresh Plateau community attack. Until now, to burn the local government under Boko Haram's firm control, Zulum tells senators. Uh, 3,121 killed in road crashes in six months, and that's from an NBS report. INX 20 million new voter uh, target, shaky, 2.4 million registered. Still on the punch, Buhari lifts Twitter ban after 222 days suspension. Um, Fire me meets Tinubu over 2023 presidency, Ikiti governorship poll. Zamfara communities uh, panic over bandits' one-week ultimatum for 35 million naira levy. And Andrians pour encomiums on ex-Oyo Governor Alao Akala. Uh, we can also find here, Namdekanu uh, writes, begs U.S. to witness anti-terror trial. Those are the big ones on the Punch newspapers this morning. Away from the Punch, let's check out the nation. Bandits kill 51 burn houses in attacks on communities. Many feared kidnap on Kaduna Abuja Highway. Defense Minister in Zamfara. President orders sustained military onslaught, uh, according to Lawan and Nigerian ones action, not excuses. Federal government leaves Twitter ban with conditions. And Matt kills uh, three kids, keep bodies in freezer, Ikoyi building construction began before approval. Uh, equity gains eight, 981 billion naira in six days. And that's it on uh, the Nation newspaper. All right, and um, now to the Daily Independent. 2023 presidency, Southwest APC may ostracize Oshimbajo. I have nothing against Tinubu. Oshimbajo is my choice, says Akinola. Former Finance Minister Chu Okongu is dead. Also, at last, federal government lifts suspension on Twitter operations. Troops lack modern tools to battle Boko Haram and bandits, say governors. Nigerians are tired of stories uh, of killings, Lawan laments. Once again, Nigerians tired of stories of killings, Lawan laments. 2023 presidency, why Feni Fere won't support Tinubu and others, says Ayo Dibanjo. And um, I think we can just stop here because of time. Let's let's quickly bring in uh, our guest this morning, Ezekiel Nyayatok. Thank you so much for joining us and good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be with you. Okay. I, I want to, you know, I, I'm not sure if we can rope all the insecurity challenges, um, you know, in one uh, discussion. 
the of course uh, said president Ahmad Lawan is saying Nigerians are tired of crying and and stories and this is um, you know a couple of years after you know they've been in National Assembly um, um, and held that position there's also uh, you know on the pond terrorists on the rampage killing uh, 52 in uh, Plateau State and uh, uh, Niger State, abducting hunters and all that. And there's something also that I found interesting, saying uh, here that Zamfara communities panic after bandits give them a one-week ultimatum for 35 million naira levy. So I don't know if we can rope all these uh, into one discussion. Um, uh, sadly, yes, we can. And, um, and that first expression is failure of governance and misunderstanding or lack of understanding or deliberate misunderstanding of what governance is all about the essence of governance the things that should be done the imperatives of governance i i, I put all this together because the constitution is very 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 clear Chapter 2, Section 14, Subsection 2B, I could never quote this enough. The security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. If we live in a country where what we have reported on a daily basis is the number of killings and everything, and the Senate president the Senate president is coming to tell us Nigerians are tired of hearing the stories. I mean, I mean, how does that sound? Is he expecting me to clap for him? Let me tell you, the Senate president is the head of the arm of government responsible, one, for knowing what is the plight of the people, which is representation, two, making the laws, okay, that's clear, lawmaking, and three, oversighting the executive to ensure that the laws that they have made are carried out timelessly and effectively. The man that should know how I feel, make laws to address it, and ensure that the executive implement it. That same man is coming to tell me that the people are tired of hearing stories. You know, you just did a, a, a two minutes clip of the leader of one of the countries giving you report in two minutes. I don't think that she came to talk about, oh, how she's been overwhelmed. Oh, the, she's telling what she's done. I expect that Mr. Senate President will come and say, on account of one, two, three, these are the things that the executive must do we have given them the enabling laws to do those things, and we are going to make sure that they do them. As a matter of fact, I'm expecting him to come and tell us in the year 2021, we will follow this, we did this, and as a result, this has been achieved. A sitting governor is telling you, I was trying to understand, you know, how that the phraseology of that statement that two local governments I don't know. Is he saying has been or is under? Oh, he's saying. I think he's saying that they are currently still under uh, terrorist control. I didn't yes. get that. Yeah. I didn't that, get that. No, I think he's, he's saying that they still are under the, the control, control of, of, uh, of terrorists. If, if you read it well, which I think I tried to, unless maybe my eyes were still. Somehow. It says until now, two Borno local governments are under. Thank you. Until uh, yeah. now means that it is no longer. Uh, Until well, now. it could be it could be understood it could be understood in in you know two different ways. It could also be understood that you know even till now. <laughs> hey, no, no, till now and until now. Well, are two different expressions. Anyway, let's not go into those. You know me, I know I went to grammar school, <laughs> night school, or something. So let's not go there. Yeah, but the important you, you thing point. is that what the point I'm trying to make is that the Senate President is not the right person to come and tell me that I'm tired. I am the one to tell him I'm tired, and he should have known that by representation that I pay him for. He is the one to come and tell me, out of your being tired, which I heard you loud and clear, I did this on lawmaking, and from the lawmaking, we are oversighting in the budgetary provision, this is what we did, and 
why do we always think that everything comes down to business, contracts, buying to Kano Jet? I ask a simple question. I'm not a security expert, but at least I can think. And common sense tells me that you take the wind off the sail and then you get the ship to stop. Or you take the oxygen off the flame and the flame comes down. What is the wind of terrorism? What is the oxygen of terrorism? How have you extracted them? How? Another part of your paper says that, you know, the, the soldiers, the army, which I feel so sorry for. This is a modern age of technology, what is coming to play. But you see, these people don't think that way. They don't think governance. They are on his contract. To Kano Jet, nobody knows how much they bought it for. Nobody knows whether they were deals or not. But they just want to keep appropriating money into, you know, buying hardware, software, bad way. But how about the target, the young people? How have you created the new, new direction, vision for them to see a future that is bright, a future that is better, which they must not jeopardize by getting into the network of the terrorists? No, but you have weaponized poverty for your own political gains, and these people just want to survive. It's natural instinct. So I think that the day we sit down, look, this terrorism can be, can be wiped out when you have a government that comes to think in terms of governance and not of politics. Right now, poverty is needed for politics, and as a result, poverty must be weaponized. Right now, the people in government are doing more of politics and not of governance. All right, uh, Ezekiel Yaitok, for the want of time, because we're, you know, time is actually not our friend at this point. Let's look at the leadership newspaper. Seven months after the federal government leaves ban on Twitter and its operation. Now, uh, two points here. Some persons are saying that this has really not achieved anything. The ban has not achieved anything entirely. You just, it just feels like someone was unhappy about a particular action and then they decided to say, hey, let's exercise our muscle and you know, put out the power play out there. And that's what happened. And another school of thought is saying that this is just, uh, you know, we're just closer to the 2023 elections and the government has a need to sell themselves you know, put up the uh, agenda and what have you, and that's why they have taken off this ban. But we'd like to share your thoughts on the, the Twitter ban that has been lifted. The essence was not nationalistic. The approach was not ingenious. But the, there was a good reason to take that action. And there are certain outcomes of that action which should be commended. For instance, getting Twitter to pay tax to Nigeria is good. I like it. Number two, getting Twitter to establish an office in Nigeria, no matter how you look at it, one or two people will be employed. It's good. I like it. No, Number well, three. Well, have these things have these things been done? That's what they told us when the conditions for lifting, unless they just, you know, these people, man, man, it, we live in a very interesting country. That's what they told us. If it's that they've come to enter a deal and jettison what they told us, we're going to know. Because after they've lifted the ban, I'm expecting that they will tell me this is where Twitter office is. And of course, uh, you know, taxis are, are, are like, like um, ghosts. You know, you just see figures. You don't know how they come about. But if we lived in a more transparent system, we will be able to know the, 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 the taxes that have accrued to Nigeria from MTN, from Twitter, from all these other bodies. But even if you use the Freedom of Information Bill to want to look for these things, the reason is simple. When they are transparent, there will be a lot of questions. And we know that our people are more into negotiating for themselves than for negotiating for the nation. So bottom line on the whole matter is that, you see, sometimes you dig a hole without knowing that you'll be the one to fall on it. Because now you think that you need them for you to, you know, make your point as the, um, um, as the this thing is coming, uh, elections. But let me tell you that many of the people that are, 
in power right now are going to be out of power before election time. They are going to defect. So if you're not careful, the rope that you tied is going to be used against you. And on the other hand, if you think that you can say what you want and Twitter will not say anything, if opposition says anything, you will now be able to start pulling the ropes. Nigerians are watching. We are not as dumb as you think they are. And uh, at the end of the day, they will know that they have inadvertently played into the hands of Nigerians, thinking they are smart. Oh, well. Um, let's also talk about something else um, on the Daily Independent. Uh, it says here, 2023 presidency, Southwest APC may ostracize Oshimbajo. Um, also, um, I have nothing against Sinubu. Oshimbajo is my choice, says Akinla. There's also Afenifere saying, or Ayadibanjo of Afenifere saying, that uh, he will not be supporting Bolamed Tinubu. So it's a little bit of back and forth and controversy with regards to these two persons. Uh, bear in mind that the vice president has not in any way stated that he will be running for president. <laughs> you see, the politics of the Southwest is a very interesting politics. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's just general politics generally, only that they are more, I think if I have to rate Nigeria generally, I'll say the North is number one, the Southwest is number two, and probably the South is South South. I don't know how we've come into politics. Because when you look at 2023 presidency, while the Igbos want to have the presidency, the Southwest have seized the narrative. And all of a sudden, we're talking about um, uh, Tunubu, Oshibanjo, Southwest, Southwest, and I can't find Southeast in the mix. And that's because these people have an understanding of how politics is played. They've considered certain things in the North, but they've come to say, look, North, don't talk too loud. Remember how many years you were running around with uh, Buhari? You could not do anything. I am the one that was able to fix you there. So be careful. So they've been able to put the fear of God in the North. And as a result, they don't mind that they had eight years of um, uh, President Obasanjo. You also had eight years of, uh, as president and uh, Oshibanjo eight years as vice president. And that during this current dispensation, the Southeast have not had a president. They've not had as a, a vice president. But they are coming back and seizing the narrative because the Southeast is not able to put themselves together. They've not had a president. They've not had a vice president. They are agitating. They are unhappy. But nobody's hearing them. The reason is simple. Their political strategy and maturity leaves much to be desired. When it comes to trade, give it to them. They've got it. But when it comes to bureaucracy and you know, politicking, the Southwest seems to be better at the game. So for me, what is going on, as far as I'm concerned, is a strategy where the narrative is now focused on the Southwest. And that Tinubu, um, Oshiba just thing, I wouldn't be surprised if it is just a deliberate staging such that the narrative comes to ours, you know, kind of uh, at the back of our minds, coming to accept that, oh, it might go to the Southwest. Now the narrative is no longer about the Southeast. Think about it. The narrative is Southwest. Should it be uh, Tinubu? Should it be Oshibanjo? Should it be Tinubu? Should it be Oshana? And everybody is talking about it. Well, so much so that well the Ebony State they, Governor uh, has also stated that he would like to run for president. Okay. No, he's not stating. Even me, I can state now that I'm, I'm going to run. Tell me the media narrative that is talking about Igbo presidency as being the focus of the narrative. No, it's not there. You know what I'm talking yeah, well. about. It's not there. Well, I remember also in the build-up to the 2019 elections, uh, one of the promises that were made, because I was still in the Southeast then, and one of the promises that were made by the APC, um, you know, campaigners was, you know, that the Southeast should support President Muhammadu Buhari so that... Uh, you know, they can get and, presidency and that, and that for the, 2023. Yeah, and that is, you know, the how, highest, how you know, you, opportunity they will have so that they can get 2023. Should that come from you? Should that not have been the subtle thing put to Nigerians to the end that Nigerians reject APC because uh, they are deceitful. There's a way, you know, strategy means that there's a way you can diplomatically turn a kind of thinking, a narrative. You can spin a narrative, especially if you have the fact on your side. That particular thing will show you can 
blackmail APC as you, you've got to come clean and, and show yourself as a man of integrity. That, not, that, that pronouncement should have been all over the media, everywhere, to the end that these guys would show themselves as either being insincere or being people of integrity. And if they are insincere, the nation will know them for that. If they are people of integrity, they will say, yes, we say it. Yes, we stand by our words. Our people stand down. It is Southeast. But the Southeast is not pushing that narrative. Oh, wow. He said the Southwest is pushing the narrative of two people. And at the end of the day, two of them will enter house and say, bros, you know I'm your guy. I'm your boy. Send your boy. I'm your guy. Stay for me. And there will be a family meeting. They will have signed. And Nigerians would have, you know, subconsciously accepted that it's going to the southwest so in other, in, in other words you're saying that you know the politics that's going on in the south is is not uh, i mean do, those who have decided to declare their interests are not united there's no unity is that what you're saying there's no unity there's no narrative from the southeast and i, I feel pain because these guys have extremely intelligent people look at let me bring out two people a guy like Mohalu. nigerians know about him who is coming to give him capacity? Look, one man in his state, Anambra state, is richer than the whole state. So it's a matter of coming together and they give him, if Mohalu is given a certain capacity today, Nigerians will take him serious for two reasons. Number one, he's had executive, you know, whatever uh, experience, a little bit, you may say, he's had exposure, he is cerebral, he is likable, and all those things. But people is, can he, can he, and they can give him that can he capacity. It's very easy, number one. Number two, you bring a man like Peter Obi, he's loved by the people. I'm telling you this. The answer because of what he did in Ambra State. And at a time like this, that Nigeria is in dire need of a man who sits on the job, feels for the country, thinks about the money of the people, and then he said, well, and he did it eight years as a governor. But these guys would rather tell him, you cannot be, you cannot be, you cannot be. Then they bring Omahi in the mix. Omahi is relatively new. He ran a small economy, and he cannot compare a man that has done eight years in Anambra State and has also run as a vice presidential candidate in terms of, you know, political pedigree and everything. This man, just get one, two, three people and push them out. But that's not happening. And it should be the case. I think, I feel, if you should come to the South, as far as I'm concerned, my position is different. Nigeria needs a messiah to get us off the woods right now. But if you must talk in terms of zoning, if you must talk in terms of zoning, I tend to think that the South is have a better um, a stake or claim to that seat. Okay. But All right. You, well, let's just quickly share your thoughts on this one. It's on the leadership. 81,000 apply for 10,000 police jobs. Uh, what do you think about this? I think that people, you see, a, the police job, Nigerians should be made to understand, is a certain social service. The policing job is one of the most sensitive nationalistic services and not job for boys. So when you have people recruit, going for the recruitment, they, are not, they don't understand what policing is in the real sense. They understand policing from, oh, you stand on the road, you make a lot of money and this. And that is why we are having what we are having today. I expect the federal government to set up a certain profiling template for employment and recruitment into the police, to make the police to be very, very professional, to make the police to be, to be service-based. People, we used to join Boy Scouts in those days because we thought it was good. If you look abroad, some children say they want to be firemen because they see as service. Some young people say we want to be nurses we, because they, want, they have this heart to serve. That is where the police force comes in. But you have people who are coming with the mentality to make money. So their only is to go to the road, harass people and everything. And that is not policing. And Nigerians should know better. Our leaders should know better. They should say, you no. Know, like we're going to work in in NNPC and oil company. Well, but it, it probably is an effect of the of the unemployment, you know, across the country. Exactly. And so everyone is trying to get yeah, a job. Yeah, yeah, but, but let me tell you. What do you expect when I do, what, what, when you have? I mean, that's a job vacancy right no, there. You know, jobs. This. No level of unemployment is going to make you to bring people to become doctors who are not trained. Very true. No level of unemployment. So you need to pick out certain part of 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 the system. 
and create a myth, a system about it for the ultimate good of the state. While unemployment, you go into all that youth enterprise and all that, like in Akwaibom, I was one of those that was in the forefront of Akwaibom Youth Development Bill. Go on that, create a template where entrepreneurs will be brought from the youth side and you train them, you give them job, you give them capacity. That is a template that is general. But you say, when it comes to the police, it's got to be this. You've got to be a graduate. They will have enough. You've got to have this pedigree of social service. They will have enough because they just want right. 10,000. The people that meet that criteria, you can have over 200,000 of them. Absolutely. So um, sit as a down the talk. police is different. Um, you know, I think you need the hill on the on the on the head when you spoke about uh, you're not going to just recruit doctors because you know people are looking for jobs. Same thing with pilots. There are certain certain jobs that are very very sensitive. Um, you know, and cannot be played with, played with. But we're out of time uh, with our discussions this morning. We always enjoy speaking with you. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us and for uh, being a part it's of It's a pleasure, program. and I wish you an amazing 2022. You too. All right, stay with us to look back in history and share with you what happened on this day in history many years ago. And then when we back, we're talking about uh, the suit problem in River State Port Harcourt. Stay with us.